All right, welcome back. So in the previous video, we talked about the definition of mass. What is mass? It's a measure of how much matter you have in an object. In this one, we're going to talk about the role that mass plays, particularly in dynamics problems. Specifically, in these dynamics problems, mass plays the role of inertia. So previously in your statics course, so previously in your statics course, you had some sort of object you might draw like this. And you had a bunch of forces acting on this object. And remember, forces are things that push or pull on my object. So recall what we do in statics is we take all those forces and we add them up together. And we set the, the sum of all those forces to zero. Maybe I should say the zero vector. And we also might sum up all the moments and let those equal to zero too, but I'll, I'll leave that part off for now. But what this says is all our forces adding up to zero, that means if this body is going to be in equilibrium, then all those forces have to balance out somehow. You can't have any net force left over because if we have some left net force left over, it's gonna start moving. Again, this is statics. This is, this is the study of things that are not moving, that are static which means nothing's changing. And this equation we have right here is what we call the equilibrium equation. This is the equation that must be satisfied in order to keep all those forces balanced, in order to keep that object from moving. But statics was last semester, all right? Now we've moved on. Now we're gonna study dynamics. And instead of having equilibrium equations, in dynamics we have what are called equations of motion. And we're gonna think of it kind of the same way. We're gonna look at all these forces acting on the body. We're gonna add them all together. So there's some of all my forces. And we're going to consider what happens when these forces do not all add up to zero. When these forces do not all add up to zero, we have an imbalance, right? When we have this imbalance, we don't have equilibrium. When we have this imbalance, things are going to start to move. These equations of motion right here come from a physical law. It's called Newton's second law. And Newton's second law states that when we add up all these forces, generally what we get is a mass times acceleration. And you'll notice in Newton's second law here, we have a role for the mass. There's the mass. So let's go ahead and talk about the dynamics. And in the context, we'll talk about the role of the mass. So let me get rid of the statics here and move dynamics over. So when you see this word inertia right here, what should you be thinking? The words that are the definition that should come to mind, at least sort of an everyday definition. Inertia is a resistance to change. And when I think about Newton's second law down here, from the perspective of inertia as a resistance to change, what I'd like to do is I'd like to rewrite this thing a little bit. So I have my sum of my forces, right? That's just what we had before. And what I like to do is I like to move the mass over to the other side. So here I'm going to have a one divided by a mass, right? A one divided by inertia, whatever that means. Let's, so if I do that, then on the right hand side, the only thing I have left is the acceleration right here. And what's acceleration? By definition, you will recall that it's a time derivative of velocity. So the important thing to note here is that this acceleration right here, it is, as I said, the time derivative of velocity. It is the rate of change of velocity. And notice this word change, right? Remember inertia was a resistance to change and acceleration itself is a rate of change of velocity. So to illustrate this idea of a mass as an inertia, as a resistance to a change, let's consider a problem here. So I've got my, my daughter pushing on the family cruiser here and let me draw a free body diagram. So here I have the car and what are the forces acting on the car? Well, I have the weight pulling straight downward. The weight of this car, by the way, is around 2,500 pounds. Then I have the normal force. This is the force of the road pushing on the car upwards. Now I'm going to assume that there's no friction between the road and the car. This is not exactly true, but I think in this problem we can make this assumption. This will probably be a, a, a discussion for later in this semester. But nonetheless, we'll neglect that friction between the road and the car. And that just leaves us with one more force. It's the force at which my daughter is pushing the car, right? So I'll call that push F. So there's all my forces. I just have three of them in this case. But let's notice something. When we sum all these forces together, what happens? Well, there's no way that these three forces can add up to zero, right? I've got weight and normal force both acting vertically, but just one force, my pushing force, my daughter's pushing force acting horizontally. There's nothing to balance out this horizontal force. So these forces cannot add up to zero. So therefore, I'm going to get a change in velocity, right? I'm going, going to have an acceleration. Now this car is big, right? It has a lot of mass, or at least it has a lot of mass compared to my daughter. 
right? So M here, this is the mass of the car. This thing's quite large. And what does that mean for this system? Well, without doing any calculations at all, you can probably guess what it means, but let me, let's put it in motion. Let's get her going. So here she, she is pushing against the car and look what's happening. The car is changing its velocity, but it's changing its velocity rather slowly, right? And why is that? Because mass is big. I take this force, the total sum of the forces on this thing, the total net force, which is really the push that my daughter is applying to this car, but I'm dividing that whole thing by a big number. Because this thing has a big mass, it has a big inertia, because I'm dividing that bit by that big number, I get a relatively small rate of change of velocity, right? The bigger the mass, the more inertia I have. That is the more resistance I have for the velocity to change. Let me just reiterate that one more time. Big mass means big inertia, which means big resistance to change, right? This velocity doesn't want to change much when my daughter's pushing on it as hard as she can. All right, so now let me change things a bit. Instead of pushing the family cruiser, Let's suppose that my daughter is pushing this car. What's the difference between doing this car and the, and the previous one? It has a lot less mass, a lot less matter contained in this object. Therefore, when she pushes the car, the results are more or less what you would probably expect. Watch it go. If we look at Newton's second law here, we can see what's happening. Now I'm dividing by a much smaller mass, right? It has a much smaller inertia which means this number I get in the end is much bigger than it was for the, for the family cruiser, right? So with the smaller mass, I get a much larger rate of change of velocity. I get a bigger acceleration. All right, so let me show you one more video. In this one, both kids are pushing the car and you can see that that force creates a change in velocity, right? The velocity is changing. But wait a second, they're gonna let go right there. Notice that they just let go of the car. Now there's a, no unbalance of force. So what's going to happen? The car is not going to stop, right? What this says is when the forces all balance out to zero, the car doesn't stop. It means the velocity doesn't change. So when they let go, the car keeps on going at that same velocity. Here it is, the car is still going, right? To bring the car to a stop, they actually have to push the other way. That's what Newton's second law is exactly telling us. Now let me go back to one more source of confusion that, that I often have with students. Remember from the previous video that mass and weight are two different things. I think I mentioned it earlier. This car right here weighs 2,500 pounds. There's no way whatsoever that my daughter can produce a force equal to or even close to 2,500 pounds. She's not lifting the car. She's not lifting it against gravity. Instead, what she's doing, she's pushing against the inertia of the car. She gets it to accelerate. Any force will get it to accelerate, right? But because there's so much mass, it accelerates rather slowly. Now to wrap it up, let's go through that thought experiment we did in the previous video. Let's suppose we have this car over here on the left. Let's suppose that one's on Earth. And the one on the right, the identical car, let's put this one on the moon. Now I've already stated that on Earth this car weighs 2,500 pounds. I guess that weight would be in the minus J hat direction, if J hat's positive upwards. Now on the moon, this car, the same car, identical car, would only weigh 413 pounds, a lot less. The weight would be less. So if one wanted to lift the car, then one might be able to do that, right? All you have to do is be able to lift 413 pounds in order to get this car off the ground, on the moon that is. However, remember the masses of the two cars are identical, right? They're the same car, so they have the same mass, even though the weights differ. So therefore, if I push the car on Earth with this, maybe a force of 200 pounds and push the moon cart with the force of 200 pounds, both of them will accelerate the same amount to the right, right? Because they have the same mass. They have the same inertia, which is independent of weight. It's separate. It's a different thing than weight. Of course, all this assumes there's no friction in this problem, but that's it. Kind of interesting, huh?